Okay, occurrences in reference to the occurrences of slave, the word. Mm -hmm. Who's doing these translations and revisions? <laughs> Well, I mean, there are various people on committees that, that produce these, but I don't think there's anything um, malign in what's going on. As I said, um, one of the, thing, the changes, I think, is the, the two world wars, which actually had a big change, certainly in Britain, where you go from a much more hierarchical society to a less hierarchical society, um, which means that terms like manservant, maidservant, bondservant, these all become, sound very archaic. Um, and actually people try and simplify that. Um, nowadays, you don't even have servants. I mean, you may have people who work in your house like servants, but you call them your, your cook, your um, you know, au pair. You use any term other than the word servant. If you use the word servant to them, they will feel pretty insulted. You know? And so uh, that's where we've got to realize there have been some changes going on, and I think the translators are trying to respond to that. They're looking at... Um, making translations less archaic. They find these old words like manservant, and they think, what does that mean? It means the word slave, and so that's what they do. There's nothing sinister about it, but there is a consequence to that. So, you know, if we think about the King James Version, the interesting thing is that was made in 1611. Arguably, uh, slavery began in North America in 1619, so it's just eight years later, and so it's worth thinking about uh, how there is... Um, that time gap. They are writing at a time when none of that's happened. They're translating at a time when none of that's happened. But it's just interesting to think about. Um, for us, the word slave is a very important word. Um, I find it a very good word to describe political realities, but a very, very poor term when it comes to analyzing substance. Uh, because actually, um, I do believe that sometimes it can be right for people to... Um, be forced to work. I don't think there are many situations in which that's the case. The terrible thing about what went on in you know, New World slavery was um, the sheer oppression and justice and everything about it. Um, you know, the whole thing stinks. But just narrowly isolating the question of can someone in a particular circumstance be morally made to work for someone else? Um, I don't necessarily have a problem in every circumstance. There might be very few circumstances we come across today, but I'd, you know, you know, in the cases of crimes and so on, I don't have a problem with that. Okay, so is Jesus Lord or King? Yes. <laughs> Should someone be fixing these translations? Yes. Since you're on the English Standard Version Committee, can we expect that to be done soon? No. Might you know the percentage of slaves in the ancient societies of Israel, Rome, or the southern U.S.? Um, arguably, they're reasonably similar. The way you get the ancient um, uh, possible slavery numbers in the Old Testament, and this is where we get onto the subject of numbers in the Old Testament, where Mark and I have some different perspectives, but actually um, we have a census that goes on in the days of, of David, and we also know how many people Solomon drafted in order to um, do his construction. Now, Solomon's actually described as being pretty oppressive uh, to people. It's interesting that he does the draft. It's, um, I think it's uh, one month on and two months off, which is quite an interesting thing because it's not actually as oppressive as it, it could be, but in relative terms, he was oppressive. And you do get to something close to 20%, um, of, uh, which is not that dissimilar to what you'd find with other settings. But I think actually Solomon is not um, set up as um, an ideal in, in that sense. Um, he is um, described as walking in all the ways of David his father, which is different from walking in all the ways of the law of Moses, isn't it? Okay, slave of all, subject to none, dutiful servant of all, and slave to all, Galatians 3. Can you please explain the different uses by Paul? <clears throat> well, one of the things Paul's doing is he's writing to people who are um, in, in context where there are many slaves, many free people in, in Roman context. And he uses the words free and slave of everyone. So in Romans, we see how he will um, say you, you can be um, slave to sin, free from God, or you can be... Um, um, free from sin and a slave of God. 
And so these categories apply in every way. He also uses slave language of the way we should um, uh, submit ourselves to others. So this is clear in Philippians, where uh, we are to have the same mind, which is in Christ, who took on the very form of a servant, using the word doulos there in Greek, uh, where um, uh, that is actually a path to follow, that we are, um, just as it says in the Gospels, the Son of Man didn't, uh, you know, came to serve, not to be served. So I think um, there are all sorts of ways that Paul's using this. But you've got to remember that these are not statements of the of the, the absolute, they're, they're statements of, um, uh, which are trying to help us um, grasp some of what's going on, but the underlying direction of things is that those who are in Christ are going to go into this enormous inheritance with Christ. Uh, and, and there is this sense, as we have in the Old Testament, where Joshua brought the children of Israel into their inheritance. We have the same sense in the New Testament that people are going to inherit them. You know, as, as Christ says, the meek will inherit the earth. Um, so there is that. Um, it's not a sense that uh, you will, um, you know, uh, as you give yourself up and as you um, um, serve others, that that will be a situation of... Uh, of everlasting pain. In fact, rather, it's a situation that just as Christ gave, um, gave up his situation and served and received the name above all names, um, so we, as we follow in his path, there is a, a crown um, and an inheritance for those who do that. Okay, lightning round. Okay. In the Old Testament law, were successive generations of a person who was in servitude automatically placed in servitude themselves? Probably. So I think with the non-Israelites, it's not clear to me that the Jubilee worked, as in the Jubilee seems to me specifically for Israelites. However, I think we need to understand that there are, um, you know, I would say that as regulating law, and also that these people have real religious uh, access and privilege, the Nethinim, arguably, in the temple, um, who are um, in that sort of servitude uh, need, need to be understood as, as people having some privileges. If buying a slave was actually buying a lease on a person's future work in the Old Testament, was there always the assumption that a time period was set for their servitude? I don't think so. Uh, and I think one of the reasons why is we've got to think of a different culture in, in which um, everyone is tied to a family somewhere. And so just as in a feudal system in the Middle Ages in Britain, uh, it would be very hard for many of these people to imagine themselves outside of that. A lot of people wouldn't really have desired. I mean, if you're in Abraham's house, I don't think you would necessarily have desired to be anywhere else. Um, you know, so that's where I, I think we've got to understand, just as you know, many people take up all sorts of forms of employment today, um, that the Old Testament law says if you, you know, someone wants to run away, you give them a place because they clearly had a very hard time. Um, but actually, that's not the general... Uh, rule. Um, are corporate visa sponsorships or the foreign domestic help arrangements where you give someone room, board, limited pay, one day off per month, similar to Old Testament slavery? I think some of them will be similar to some of the situations that uh, pertain for particular individuals. Yes, these are household dependents. Um, and uh, nowadays we're in a very individualistic context where we, think, we don't think of people outside of households and we all just pursue our own employment. But I think that, that, can, be some, that can be an ana analogy, but you want to make sure you don't push the analogy too far. Okay, I love these questions. What some people think of is just really cool. Um, so this is just a practical question. Peter Williams, which do you believe to be worse? Slavery, as practiced in the Old Testament, or self-imposed slavery to success? power, wealth, popularity, especially in Western culture. Which would you choose? Well, I mean, I, I think that if you're going to look at the long-term um, thing, you know, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Um, by far the worst thing would be if uh, being a slave of sin, being a slave of your own ambitions and so on, um, the eternal consequences of that are um, far worse than being, uh, you know, a, uh, at, at someone else's command. Uh, amen. Okay, this person um, may have meant, I don't understand, they may not listen to Bob Dylan, Jim Hoffmeyer, because they said, does the New Testament support the idea of freedom from servanthood 
or does everyone have to serve somebody? Which Bob Dylan said. Mm, he said, mm. you might be an ambassador to England or France. You might like to gamble. You might like to dance. You might be the heavyweight champion of the world. You might be a socialite with a long string of pearls. But you're going to have to serve somebody. Mm -hmm. So I, I think everyone has to serve somebody, yeah. Um, I mean, you, you could be Caesar, and then you can live under the temporary illusion that you're not serving anyone for your life, for your life period. Or you know. Pharaoh. Yeah, that's right. So, so th these people who are at the top who, who think that they're not actually ultimately accountable to God, and we need to realize that everything we own is, on, is on, on loan, we are stewards, and one day we appear before God and we're to give account for everything we do. And, okay. and just, that's the reality. All right, slave to sin. Slave versus servant in the New Testament. Paul talks about being a slave to sin. Christ has set us free. Were we actually slaves to sin or just servants? I, I want to use the word slave everywhere. So with the Old Testament, my preference would be to render all 800 occurrences of the word eved as servant for consistency. And then my uh, preference probably with the New Testament is to render every single occurrence of doulos as slave. All right, uh, Leviticus 19, 20 through 22. Why is a distinction to be made when a man sleeps with a slave woman versus when he sleeps with a free woman? So again, this, I would read it as because of the hardness of your heart. So Matthew 19, Mark 10, where um, actually people are in the Old Testament allowed to take these um, second-tier wives. That's not a, um, a good thing, I think, in absolute terms. When you go back to the beginning, you see this is very um, unideal. And whenever people have done that, there have been consequences. Okay, Jacob's situation of working for his wives. Was that slavery? If so, comparable to the slavery servanthood uh, referenced by Paul. I don't, I mean, in one sense, yes, I think it was slavery. Uh, uh, Laban's a, a very um, cunning person because he gets at least one month's work out of uh, Jacob before they even start negotiating on uh, price. So, you know, he's very um, keen. Uh, you, you see it back in Genesis 24 when he saw the gold on his uh, sister's arms. He suddenly got, oh, come in to Abraham's servant. So he's, he's got an eye for a deal. And um, uh, I, 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 so I think, arguably, uh, he was working somewhat like a, a slave. Um, uh, Jacob uh, says, you change my wages 10 times. That may be some exaggeration there. But um, uh, that Laban would be a very hard person to um, work for. But of course, at the same time, uh, um, Jacob did manage to do far better out of it, both in terms of the, um, the family he got and, and the sheep. Okay. Someone is really impressed with your brain because they just threw this one passage. How do you explain Deuteronomy 26, 68? Now, you cannot explain it because Deuteronomy 26 only has 19 verses. Nailed him. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't start on an answer. <laughs> How many languages have you read parts of the Bible in? New Testament, Old Testament, whatever. Uh, maybe about 12. In a society such as the antebellum South, in which slavery is morally wrong and commonplace, what obligations do Christians have in addressing the problem in society or ending it? Similar question. The slavery that happened in America was an abomination before God and man. People have misinterpreted the Bible in order to gratify their own greed. Something should be made to make this right. Yep. And uh, those two together first. Okay, so I mean, if you're asking for a Brit for commentary on the um, Civil War, I'm, I'm going to refrain. Uh, if you want to know what to make of the Civil War, no, wait, let me ask wait it this for Judgment way. Day. Here's the question. Oh, that's yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, then the question is, what, what obligations do you have? Well, yes. it depends who you are. Uh, so if you're able to get political office to change things, then obviously you should do that. Um, the question of whether um, a particular cause is worth a particular fight, I think one of the things we got with the Civil War is we got complexity of cause. It's not that there's only one thing going on. There's more than one thing going on. And, you know... Uh, 600,000 die and so on. I don't want to get drawn into uh, evaluating something. It's obviously a good thing that slavery was abolished. It's obviously a bad thing that 600 people die. You know? Um, and in order to uh, work out something, I don't want to get into the counterfactual. What would have happened if 
another historical route had gone on for the next 10 or 20 years. I simply don't know. All we know is what, what happened, and we know that a good end was achieved at a great price. Uh, last question. Uh, what then should we say to the atheists, the Sam Harrises? Well, I think one of the problems uh, with atheism, many problems, is um, firstly, what's the value of human life at all? We believe as Christians, as people who follow the Bible, even if you didn't have the New Testament just from following Genesis 1, that every human is in the image of God and therefore of infinite value. And that, under, uh, that just uh, goes through everything we, we do that we believe that. What value does an atheist put on a person near the end of their life in a nursing home who doesn't have relatives? And the answer is just about nothing. What value does an atheist put at a person at the beginning of their lives, in the womb and so on? And we believe that because everyone is in the image of God, their value is not dependent on their own contribution to society, their own skill and so on, even if they have completely lost their mind, and so there's, there's no personality to involve them because they've got a terrible form of dementia, that person is, is of infinite value. And that just uh, is, is so important, and what does an atheist have uh, to um, counter that? And the other thing is, of course, if we're just going to go in atheism, we're just going to think about, you know, um, just throwing ourselves into the pleasures of society and materialism and so on, the inevitable product of that is it's going to lead to all sorts of oppression in the whole system. The human trafficking that's going on, so much of it is being fed by the sex industry, which comes basically from a desacralization of, 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 of sexual uh, behavior, um, which, which comes as part of atheism. Uh, this is all we are. Um, why shouldn't we just uh, you know, indulge in whatever pleasures? That is one of the, well, it's surely the biggest thing driving human trafficking. And so Christians actually have something to respond positively uh, to that in, in, in wanting to um, actually take away all of the motivation for that sort of thing. So I, I think we've got a lot to say. Would you join me in thanking Peter?